Thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, my name is Sebastian. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk about packaging apps in a serverless world. So definitely, you know, we, we saw Simon's uh, talk earlier with the innovators, the early adopters. So here, when we talk serverless, it's really like innovation uh, and, and early adoption. And I'm not here to, you know, really preach. Uh, I'm really here to, you know, share some experiments and some thoughts that I have. And hopefully, you know, you'll find it useful. And then we can, you know, keep the conversation uh, going. Oh, yeah, I have a, I have a clicker. Uh, as Pini said, I, uh, in 2014, I was very curious when people got excited about containers. And I had a relationship with O'Reilly. So I said, hey, let me write you the Docker cookbook. Uh, while I did that, uh, I jumped on Kubernetes because I right away saw that you know you needed to have uh, a scheduler or an or orchestrator, you know, in a very large sense, to manage containers uh, in production. I ended up writing another book, uh, and very much you know I'm more of a researcher, experiment uh, experimentator, product owner, product manager uh, type thing. I'm still a little bit old-fashioned. I like to tell you what you know. Uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, I really love Kubernetes. Uh, I think it's a really, really powerful system with an amazing API that allows us to build uh, other systems. Uh, and, uh, and it's uh, you know, really, I think, the, the solution that we're all going to use in production to deploy application. So very early on, I did some, uh, I did some work in, uh, in Kubernetes, things like Compose, K-Machine, Cabin, uh, a mobile app, and so on. And now I'm, uh, I'm behind a, a serverless solution called Kubeless. Kubernetes serverless uh, contraction. So there were already a few talks here about serverless, uh, but I thought you know, we, we, we could use a, a few basics to, uh, to warm up about, uh, about serverless, because you know, like anything else, it's a new term, and then we could we could all argue about you know its real uh, its real meaning, right? Uh, so I would I would preface all of this by saying that I believe that there are no silver bullets. Uh, so serverless is not going to change uh, everything. It's not going to destroy your infrastructure, your way of working. No silver bullets. And I didn't invent that sentence. I mean, we all know that sentence. But a couple months ago. Um, I went back to the mythical Man Month from Frederick Brooks. And for the 20th anniversary, 1995, uh, there was an appendix about the, on the mythical Man Month. And he wrote a text called, There are no silver bullet uh, in, in software development. So that's, that's very interesting. So very much to me, it's an evolution. It's an evolution about the way we write software, about the way we put apps in production, you know, about the way we, we work. And uh, you know, we would be very tempted to say, oh, no, come on, give me a break. We, we, just, we just entered the container era. We just entered the Kubernetes era. Are you telling me that we have to now embrace serverless? You know, I mean, that's, that's a joke. Uh, but we need to pay attention to it. And we at least need to you know, pay attention and try to understand how it's changing you know, the, the way we work or how it may change the, the way we work. For me, it's really about application uh, deployment and, uh, and onboarding, OK? Uh, onboarding of you know, uh, developers that uh, write those applications and the way they, they deploy those, those apps. Uh, and since you know, I'm here uh, at, at GoTo, uh, you know, very well uh, organized by, uh, by Trifork, I, uh, you know, I didn't forget to put a slide from Container Solution. Uh, because I love that slide, and it's about you know what we are all doing with our uh, you know our apps and our CI/CD pipeline and so on. So if you've never seen that slide, you know you have waterfall model at the time, define, build, release, and the value, which is the diamond, the value comes you know all the way at the end, you know a long time after the, the start of the project. When you start going more agile, what you're trying to do is deliver value much faster along the way. And then with microservices, you know, you see that you have inner circles in, within your sprints, and you deliver value continuously. Okay, and I think that's what we are really trying to do here with those new DevOps uh, practices and new way of working. We really want to give value, you know, all along the way as we're developing, as we're putting things in production. We should always increase the the value. That that's really what we're we're trying to do. 
So in some, you know, in some way, serverless, it's nothing else than uh, a potential new way of uh, working, deploying apps, uh, developing apps, that allows us to you know, keep on delivering value extremely quickly. The name is terrible because we're all going to argue about, ah, there is a server. Yes, of course, there is a server. And that's, you know, I had that reaction at the beginning. There is a process running somewhere in a machine. So yes, serverless has servers. Uh, so terrible name, just like cloud. I mean, I remember when you know, we started with the cloud. It's like, oh, what, what does cloud computing mean? And then you, know, you got standard organization like NIST that worked on, uh, on writing a definition for cloud computing. Uh, Web 2.0, what is Web 2.0, and so on. So we are, again, we're going to go through the same process here with serverless. What is serverless? Let's try to come up with a definition, and so on. And my sense has always been that uh, you know, we are wasting our time a little bit trying to uh, find a definition of what, what, what this is. And you know, we should just look at the, the, the paradigm. What are people doing with it? And try to figure out, is it something that we should embrace? Is it going to change my way of working? And, and so on. Make sense so far? How is my French accent? Good. So definitely, the, the leader in the cloud, uh, the cloud provider for serverless, is AWS Lambda. They are the ones that uh, came up with it. You know, and actually, it's not yesterday. It was already 2014, 2015. So it's been it's been already you know three, almost four years that AWS has been uh, has been releasing Lambda. And what is what it's about? It's really about you know writing small bits of codes small business logic and deploying that business logic straight up in the cloud and then defining triggers that's very important you know what is calling those functions what is calling those lambdas so you define those triggers and those triggers can be objects arriving in your object store they can be uh, events in a data stream uh, they can be you know, a table being inserted in a, in a database, uh, you name it. Like anything in your infrastructure or any of your services should become a, a trigger to your functions. So that's what you have with, uh, with Lambda. And then the kicker is that they're saying, well, you know, you're only going to pay for when that function is being uh, called. You won't pay, you know, the, the rest of the time when nobody is using your function. So it's a very fine-grained billing process. So very attractive because, of course, you're saying, hey, we're not going to pay too much. We could, we could you know, go a little bit deeper in the, in the billing model because there, there was actually a blog uh, by some folks from a, a company called Spotinst, and they, they analyzed the cost of Lambda. And what's very interesting is that the cost of Lambda is very low, but when you're exposing your functions through an API gateway so that you can hit it with like a REST call, uh, the API gateway is actually very expensive. Okay? So you know, you're bringing the cost of the Lambda down, but you also have the cost of the API gateway, so you have hidden costs of your overall application. So it, you know, something to, to keep in mind. So now, what, what does it look like? You know, this, this, new, this new Lambda, this new serverless thing. I'm a, I'm a terminal guy, so the AWS CLI looks like this. I think it's but ugly, OK? Lambda, create function, region, function name, handler, runtime. Runtime, it's, you know, is it Python? Is it Node.js? Is it, is it Java, and so on? Memory. And then you see that there is something called zip file. So the package. And that's supposed to be a talk about packaging. We'll, we'll see if I succeed about talking about packaging. But uh, the package is a zip file. And in that zip file, you have the code. You potentially have the dependencies, you know, things like this. And that zip file gets uploaded to S3. And then under the hood, Amazon deploys that, that app you know, somewhere. Okay? So it looks, it looks like this on the terminal. But what's a serverless application? You know, what, what gets inside that zip file? And we have to, you know, we have to, to put a caveat that actually a, a complete application is going to be made of a lot of different lambdas. So there's going to be a lot of those zip files. Uh, serverless is a bad term. There is something that, that I think is uh, better, or would have been better, is service full. So some people you know, talk about it sometimes. Service full is quite nice, and I think it captures more the uh, 
uh, what we're trying to do here, which is that in this move towards cloud native, where you know we're not managing infrastructure anymore, well, kind of. Okay, just bear with me. Uh, you know, our database is in the cloud. We're using you know RDS, the DynamoDB, whatever. Uh, our archive system is Redshift. I mean, everything is a, a cloud service. Now your entire application becomes uh, basically stitching those cloud services. So now you're actually service full. Everything is a service. Okay? And what you need to do is, you know, like this goat here, you need to stitch those services together. And to stitch them, you deploy Lambda. So the Lambdas are now becoming glue for your, uh, your services. Type of apps, typical pipeline from the AWS website. I'm not trying to pretend that I make pretty pictures like this. Okay, This is straight out of the AWS website. Uh, take a picture, stick it in S3. S3 uh, emits an event. And then is, this event triggers a function. That function creates a thumbnail. And then the function sticks the thumbnail you know, somewhere else in another bucket. Thumbnail creation, image processing, you know, typical type of, of, uh, of pipelines using, uh, using lambdas. Uh, here you have a connection where you have you know, data streams, like think maybe a Twitter stream coming through Kinesis. Every time you have a, a tweet with a particular keyword, triggers a function. That function then sticks that tweet in a, in a database, things like this. And when you build those things, you have three concepts that are important in terms of applications. Um, you have the function endpoint. And if we just leave it at this, about you know, serverless, about uh, taking a, a function, you know, def, func, whatever, print hello, uh, and making that available over HTTP, we just have CGI, right? We haven't moved very much away from, from CGI. Where it becomes interesting is that you now have a bunch of triggers. So all your cloud services can emit events, and then you trigger your functions. So we're now back to building an event-based system, which is cloud native. Okay? So a cloud native event-based system, that's really, you know, to me, what serverless uh, is. Yeah, I'm being a little bit broader here than just you know, packaging. I, you know, I hope you'll, you'll find it uh, interesting. Uh, so of course, I'm, I'm an open source guy. And even though I, I work in the cloud, I use GCE at GCP, I use AWS. You know, I wish I could do exactly the same thing on-prem, OK? Because you know, sometimes you, you don't want to be uh, locked in, or you know, some of the, those services are totally proprietary. So you wish you could do, sometimes do this on-prem. So you have, at the top, the cloud provider serverless solution. Just below, you have some, uh, some solutions that uh, allow you to do serverless on-prem. Apache OpenWhisk, Oracle FN, Nucleo, OpenFAS, and then my project, the best of all, Kubeless, the one at the bottom. Uh, so you know, before I go into packaging, I want to explain a little bit how Kubeless looks. What's the, what's the architecture? Okay? Because once we understand the architecture of one of the systems, we understand how the functions can actually be deployed, we're going to have a better idea of what that, that serviceful application is, is going to, to look like. Okay? Uh, so I'm going to explain a little bit about Kubeless. But of course, there is an elephant in the room here, which is you know, fast function as a service on premise. Does it even make sense? And you know, we should have beers there. AWS is going to say, this is total nonsense. Serverless is 100% in the cloud. You cannot do serverless on-prem. It's ridiculous. You're still managing uh, infrastructure, right? So you know, we, could, we could have lots of beers and, and decide whether kubeless makes sense or, or not. Uh, but let's, let's go through the, the process, and let's try to figure out you know, if, if we have those services uh, deployed on Kubernetes, and then we are trying to deploy those functions, uh, what do they look like? How we deploy them? How can we do CI CD for those, those functions? And then how can we package that application? Okay? Uh, as I said, you know, I love Kubernetes. It's a, it's a great system. And it's a great system because the API is extremely uh, powerful. It has lots of very nice objects with which you can, you can build lots of things. 
and you can extend that API. Okay, so if you need to create your own API object, you can, you can do it with Kubernetes. It's, ex it's an extremely powerful mechanism. Uh, so what we've done with, uh, for Kubeless is that we've extended the Kubernetes API, and we've defined a function object. Okay? So instead of saying, hey, uh, schedule this container, we're now saying, hey, here is my function, and deploy that function. At the end of the day, what we end up with is a CLI that looks exactly like the AWS CLI that I, I showed you earlier. So the overall architecture at the beginning looked like this. Uh, and uh, I didn't write this in my garage. Uh, I wrote this uh, in my basement with a friend of mine. And so what we did is we extended the API server of Kubernetes with what's called a custom resource definition, a CRD. And using a CRD, we defined a function object. And then we wrote what's called a controller. And this controller just watches an API endpoint. And when it sees a function object, then it creates a Kubernetes deployment. You have a container that starts. The function code gets injected inside that container. And suddenly, you have your function up and running. Okay. All those things here that you see, deployment, service, ingress, config map, all those are Kubernetes objects. It's very important because now you have a function that's running, and that function is made of a uh, Kubernetes object. That means that you can have manifests, YAML or JSON manifests, that represent your function in a very declarative manner. Okay? So if we start thinking deployment, continuous delivery, packaging, we actually have a very proper manifest for a function. But of course, that's just basically you know, CGI made in 2018. Okay? Uh, now we need events and triggers. So here I'm going to do a little bit of a, you know, a segue. I'm not going to, to show you, you know, all of this uh, in details. But the Cloud Native Computing Foundation has a serverless working group. So it's kind of like a standard, standardization uh, working group, even though they're not trying to uh, come up with a standard. Uh, but these guys have defined a spec for a cloud event. You know, what's an event in the cloud? What is it going to look like? What's the payload going to look like? What type of metadata do we have? And, and so on. So they've come up with a spec. And I think that over the next year, that spec is going to mature. And then they will release an, a, a new spec uh, or, a, let's say, a, a 1.0 spec for what a, a cloud event is. So any of those serverless solutions that we're going to talk about, they're going to basically send cloud events in the, in the eventing substrate. And those cloud events are going to be uh, processed by the, the functions. So what we've done in, in Kubeless, uh, I'm going to show you this, is that we have actually modified now uh, the, the system, and we have created a way to, uh, to define triggers. So any any event source, so your database, your Kafka, your NATS, your Kinesis, your AWS SQS, we can, defi we can define those uh, event sources as Kubernetes objects. OK? Uh, so let's say you have, you know, you're trying to do, you're trying to do this, uh, uh, this Twitter uh, application where you have a Kinesis stream sending events to your function and then inserting those events in a database, we can actually define the mapping between the Kinesis stream and the function as a Kubernetes manifest. Okay? So, you know, I hope you're, you're still with me. I don't know how familiar you are with Kubernetes, but the, the whole point here is that. Um, we can now express a function as a Kubernetes manifest. We can express a trigger as a Kubernetes manifest. And now we're going to be able to have a complete uh, declaration of a serverless application. OK? So it, you know, that's a small example of a, a trigger for Kafka, Kafka being an event source. I'm showing Kafka because it's heavily used in the enterprise as a, an eventing system. So here, you, know, you define a, a trigger like this, and you're saying, hey, any event on this Kafka topic needs to actually 
uh, call uh, the function you know foo. So that's the that's the overall system, and I'm going to you know show you a little bit of the of the internals here. Um, so now we have this system, and let's start talking about how we're going to deploy uh, functions. And as we de think about deploying functions, then we can also start thinking, you know, how, how do I package this? What's my artifact? Uh, what, do I have in, what do I have in S3? Or what do I put in Nexus that represents my you know, serverless application? Is it, is it different than what I'm doing now? You know, is it going to totally destroy my entire pipeline? You know, so several ways to do uh, to do packaging these days. I mean, these days, uh, Docker is basically a package format, a binary blob in which you have your application. Okay, some people would call it uh, tarball, but okay. So you can see Docker as a package. Your application gets inside your uh, your Docker image. You know, via your Docker file. Whatever we can do the same thing with a function. Your function, you can stick it inside a, a Docker image, and the, the developer is in charge of doing this. Okay, the onus is on the developer to actually package the function inside a Docker image. Uh, if you do this, uh, it kills the purpose of serverless because now you know you're doing containers, uh, and a lot of people are arguing these days. They're saying, well. You know, ah, oh, there is a fight between container people, serverless people, blah blah blah. And I think the the, the point is this: is that you know, if you if you start looking as uh, at your Docker image as an artifact, as the the vehicle with which you're delivering your uh, your function, uh, then yes, you know, now you're you're talk you're making serverless really a, a container application. One of the things that I that's Causing me uh, trouble with Docker is the reprodu reproducibility and the immutability. Uh, reproducibility, that's because the, the base image that you're using may change underneath you. Okay, if you don't pay attention, like a couple years ago when we started you know, in, in Docker, we wrote Docker images, and then six months later, they were all broken because the base image had, uh, had changed, and then we were missing packages, right? So reproducibility is uh, you know, not a given. And then the immutability uh, is also not there because you can overwrite tags. So you're saying, hey, I'm using you know, foo colon uh, 1.10, blah, blah, blah. But actually, some, somebody can do a Docker push to foo colon 1.10. So you know, the images are not immutable. So you actually need to specify the SHA of your image. But you know, even there, it's not. Uh, if there is some type of garbage collection, you may actually lose your uh, your layers. Anyway, so that's Docker as a package. Now we move one step up, and we have application in Kubernetes. What's a package for an app in Kubernetes? Uh, we now have multiple containers, and we have more than containers. We also have uh, persistent volume claims. We have ingress rules. We have secrets, config maps. We have lots of different objects to make up that application in Kubernetes. Okay. Turns out that there was a little survey a couple, six months ago, eight months ago, and there was around 60 different configuration tools for application on Kubernetes. So you have like maybe 10 or 15 tools to deploy Kubernetes, but then you also have like 60 different tools to uh, package and configure uh, an app. Okay. Helm, that Simon was, uh, was mentioning, is definitely the leading package manager uh, for Kubernetes. And in the end, what Helm is doing, it's creating a tarball with all your Kubernetes manifests. Okay? So if your app is made of you know, three or four deployment objects, and then an ingress rule, and then some PVs, you stick all of this in a directory, you make a tarball, you have a chart, roughly speaking, and that's your, that's your package. Okay. So now maybe you know you can start thinking it's like oh okay you can create a package of a Kubernetes application, but he just said that his functions were uh, you know declared as functions objects because he extended the Kubernetes API. So that means that in those tarballs for charts, I can also stick manifests of functions. 
Okay? And I can package all of that as a Helm chart. So even a serverless application, if I deploy it on Kubernetes with a tool like Kubeless, a serverless application which uses many different services and has many different triggers and so on, I can package all of that the same way that I package a, a Kubernetes app. I'm going to try to show you this. So now that's, OK, that's great. We potentially have a package, but how, how do we deploy? How do we do continuous integration, continuous delivery? Uh, I don't like tests. Uh, I like delivery. <laughs> so, so let's concentrate on the CD part of things. Now, so if you are on AWS, uh, and I, I hadn't paid attention to what AWS had released uh, you know, recently, because there are really so many services that you know, it's impossible to keep up. But code build, code pipeline, and then I think they call it AWS uh, star, star build? Code star. Yeah, CodeStar kind of packages all of this as a, as a single click uh, install. So you go to CodeStar, you, you click, and basically you end up with a, a CI CD pipeline, you know, roughly speaking. So if you, if you search a little bit for how to do CI CD of uh, Lambdas, AWS Lambdas, you know, you see that you can define, you can use code build. Uh, to say, hey, you know, my code is here, generate the zip file, and then at the end of the pipeline, you have an AWS cloud formation, deploy this cloud formation. Okay? And of course, AWS has extended the cloud formation spec to contain a, a, a Lambda spec, which is using a, a special model called SAM. So in your cloud formation, you can define your function, you can define your triggers. So you have a declarative manifest for a serverless application. Bottom line, it's a CI CD pipeline. You have your code in source, and then you define build steps, and then you define delivery steps. Uh, I just did this literally uh, Friday or Monday uh, for Google. OK, some, some errors are not, are not showing up. But I wanted to show them that um, you could do CI CD on Google Kubernetes Engine for functions. And you can, use, you can do this exactly like you do it on AWS using what Google has, which is called Container Builder. Okay? So it's a little bit hidden in their, in their UI because Container Builder is actually <laughs> accessible through the Google Container Registry. <laughs> I mean, it's impossible to keep up with all those things. I mean, that, that, I think that's a huge problem in our industry. I mean, the only reason why I kind of keep up is because that's what I do every day. But if you're actually managing production, I mean, I, I, I don't know how you can keep up. Uh, so one of those icons there is Container Builder. Uh, you, define, uh, build, you define build steps in your source repository. Then uh, in the UI, you can define your, uh, you know, your triggers, your automated builds. You can potentially generate artifacts that are stored in storage. That's where you put your zip or your tarball. But you can also define custom steps. So you can say, hey, at the end of this pipeline, kube control apply. So if your pipeline generates a big manifest, of all your application, you can then deploy you know, everything uh, in your cluster, including functions. So I'm going to show you this. Okay. So let's do a little demo. Let's see how, how we're going to, to do. So if, if you haven't never seen um, Kubernetes, OK. So here I have a cluster on Google Kubernetes Engine. Um, so I'm not managing any infrastructure. I literally type one command to create that cluster. And what's crazy is that uh, it does uh, node auto repair, auto upgrade, auto scaling. Uh, it has lots of you know, production features that come just uh, out of the box. If I look at everything that's running in this uh, Kubernetes cluster, <coughs> hopefully you can see this. Uh, in Kubeless, you see that I have this Kubeless controller. Okay? 
And if I look at what are called custom resource definitions, uh, you see that I have a function custom resource definition, a function CRD. When you define this CRD, what you end up with is that suddenly you extend the Kubernetes API. So now my Kubernetes cluster here is aware of functions. That's not something that you get out of the box in Kubernetes. Okay? It's not part of the Kubernetes core. But I get it because I deployed kubeless in that cluster. And now you know, even the kubectl client uh, dynamically discovers this new type of, uh, of object. And I do have a function here that's, uh, that's deployed, which is foo. So I can say get function foo and give me the manifest for that function. And I get a lot of pretty, uh, pretty YAML. And you see here that it says kind function. So that's what I mean when I talk about extending the, the Kubernetes API. Anybody can do this. You define a CRD that basically creates a new, func a new object, a new kind. And then you write what's called a controller. Okay? So the controller watches the API endpoint and then uh, performs things. Okay? So, uh, what do I have in this repository here? You'll see that I have a function, which is Python function, as simple as they, they come. I need to try to come up with a, uh, a better, more interesting example. But it just returns hello, go to. And if you post with an event, it just prints. Okay? And then what I did here is that I wrote a you see, it's funny because the function is five lines, but the, the build definition uh, in Container Builder is you know, 10 times uh, more than the, the actual function code. So you'll see that this is, this is Google Container Builder um, uh, spec. Uh, for, for AWS, it would be a build spec file, and it actually looks a lot, uh, a lot like this. So you have multiple steps. First step, it calls kubeless. And you'll see that I'm actually running Bash. It's a terrible hack. I just finished it this morning. Uh, this is just to set up the environment. And here you have my beautiful CLI. Kubeless function deploy. You say it's Python 3.6. You have a handler. You specify the file, foo.py. And then here at the end, look what I'm doing. I'm actually doing a dry run. By doing a dry run, this step is not going to create the function. It's actually going to generate a manifest for the function. And then you know, I'm sticking this manifest in the file. And if you look at the next step, you know, those of you who are familiar with Kubernetes, and you know, you'll recognize the kubectl apply-f, the function. Okay? So this is typical declarative uh, object management in, in Kubernetes. So this is you know, running now. If we go in the Google uh, interface, so that's what I was saying about the, uh, those builds, is that their container builder appears under container registry. And you can define build triggers. You see, add trigger. You, know, you could add trigger. And you see that here I define a trigger for my repo which contains my code. Okay? So here that's my GitHub repo, which has the cloud build that I showed you. Okay? And it has the function, the basic function that I showed you. Okay? Uh, so what we can do is that we can trigger this build by hand function. Of course, the build will be triggered if I do a, a git push. Okay. You'll see where I'm going with this. I'll, I'll fall back onto packaging. <laughs> I promise. I'm just showing you basic CI CD in, in actually a, a fairly decent environment because I'm running in GKE. My source code is on GitHub. Uh, you know, and all the builds are automated. So the build just finished. I look at my build. I see that it ran my four steps. The first step was about deploying the function. And then the second step was about tr creating a trigger. And in that particular, uh, particular example, I'm just creating a simple HTTP trigger. 
So I want to be able to call my function over HTTP, which basically in, uh, in Kubernetes uh, world means that I'm creating an ingress object. Yeah, I don't show cat pictures in my talk. I, 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 like, to, uh, I like to talk uh, technique. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. <laughs> so technically, my function is running. So if I do uh, get function, I have my foo function. I mean, it was running, it was running before. Uh, kubeless under the hood created what's called a deployment. So I see a foo deployment. And then I also see that because I created the trigger, it created an ingress uh, object, and I registered uh, a DNS name, kubeless sh, uh, for it. So now I can just, you know, curl HTTP func kubeless.sh, and I've go to. Okay, so that's not like you know super impressive. So. <laughs> I think, you know, what we can do it. I think I did it here. So I'm going now to run this in a while true. So while true, I'm going to curl and sleep, OK? So it's going to say hello, go to all the time. OK, fine. So now I'm going to edit my function, and I'm going to say hello, pinny, git add foo git commit whatever, git push. OK, it's pushed. Automatically, my container build is going to be triggered. It's going to run all my steps in GKE. It's going to redeploy, uh, reapply my function manifest with the new function, uh, you know, SHA, whatever. And then at some point, I should see hello, Pini. Maybe. 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Yeah, here you go. Yeah, demo, great. Are you <laughs> impressive, no? <laughs> so we could we could continue with this because there is you know those that that trigger mechanism. You see that at the end of my step here, I create the trigger. I define the host name. So the, I mean, this is just uh, Kubernetes stuff, right? I mean, not right, but believe me if you don't know Kubernetes. Here I can define a path, and I can say, well, actually, the function shouldn't be exposed at funkkubeless.sh, but should be exposed at funkkubeless.sh slash pini, right? So we can, you know, we specify the path, and we git add, we git commit. Uh, so. so same thing with the trigger. The trigger is also defined declaratively, and you know you get it in that uh, through your uh, continuous delivery uh, system. So what's going to happen here is that at some point when the uh, the trigger is going to be uh, updated, this shouldn't work. Right, because I'm I'm curling uh, I'm curling uh, funk kubeless.sh. So at some point, this is going to barf. Here you go. So now I'm hitting the kubeless ingress controller at funk kubeless.sh, but the ingress rule has changed. So this is saying, hey, you know, I, I don't know what to do with this uh, this request. I'm going to my 404 default HTTP backend. Right, uh, control C. So instead of this, what I need to do now is slash pini, right? And if I hit slash pini, I fall back on my slash pini. So the, you know, <laughs> it's <laughs> maybe it's not super impressive, uh, but I think it's very powerful. The mechanics are very powerful, OK? Because now what you have is that you have continuous delivery of functions. Uh, I didn't write a Docker file. Did you see me writing a Docker file? I didn't write a Docker file. I didn't write a Kubernetes manifest, OK? I'm just literally you know, working on my function and setting up my, uh, my options in my, uh, in my build pipeline, OK? So let's go back to the slide, and then I have one more, one more demo. So that's continuous delivery with Container Builder. Uh, 
So as I said at the beginning, you know, I'm experimenting and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here to share you know, some of those experiences and maybe, you know, maybe I'm totally off here, but that particular example is kind of weird because I don't have a package. <laughs> I just have code, right? I, there is no zip, there is no, there is no artifact. I just have code that, that I push to my, uh, to my repo and automatically that code gets injected uh, uh, in, um, you know, in my uh, in my cluster, so you don't write a Docker file, you don't write uh, manifest. We don't have a, we don't have a zip, uh, but we have a declarative manifest. Okay, so I'm like, mm. I do love it because uh, the infra comes really cloud native. It's you know Kubernetes, GKE, very easy to set up, uh, and I'm not focused on the build. In the sense, you know, how to build my app. I'm really focused on on the code and you know only only the code and then how to to route and trigger that code. Okay, so it's very delivery focused, and I I really like that that aspect uh, of things. Now, you know, that's that's a very sim uh, a simple example. It's just a function, so you can imagine having you know way more than one function. Uh, there could be many different repos, and you could you could do this. You could define different types of trigger exactly the same way. Uh, there is uh, a different aspect uh, where you actually create a package, and that's when we we talk again about service full application package. So there is a repo here that's GitHub.com bitnami labs Redis demo. I invite you to look at it. It's a to do application. It has a Redis backend. And then you create routes, like f to, to create to-dos, delete to-dos, and so on. You create those routes using, uh, yeah, those routes using functions. Okay? So the functions are deployed thanks to uh, kubeless. Uh, we also deploy Redis, but has a chart. Okay? And the entire thing is packaged as a chart. Okay? So we do have a full package, which is now just a, a tarball. So let me, let me show you this. So that's, uh, you know, I have my code. I just cloned the repo. Uh, and then if I go back. So in that same cluster, I have Helm installed. And now what I'm doing is Helm install, you know, give it the name to do. Uh, dot means that all the, the actual artifacts are local. I could be pointing to a chart repository, but here everything is local. And then I do set up an ingress here when I do the deployment, and, I, and the, the host is todo.kubeless.sh. Okay? So you do this. This is typical Helm. Bang. And then we do, a, we do a get pods w We watch. So you see that Helm, oops, Helm. You know, when I did the install, you see here, when I did the Helm install, it actually installed functions. So I have read all, delete, update, create, read one. I have five functions that actually have been deployed. So that's very interesting. So that means that now if I do a get functions, I see all my function. And if I look at my to-do create, uh, you see? the the function code, because it's an interpreted language, I actually see the source directly in the function manifest. We support Java and Golang as build, so it's a little bit different. Uh, but here you see the, the code directly here. So that's my, that's my create all function. Okay. So oh, all the pods are running. We see that we have a pod for the to-do create, the to-do delete, the front end, and we see that we also have a Redis master and a Redis slave. That came as a dependency of that application via a Helm chart. All package, single, you know, single setup. So, uh, escape, okay. Escape, and I go to do kubeless sh, and bang. Hi, Seb. Oh, yeah, that's Samir. OK. Hi, Pini. Hi, Pini. How to do? The delete. Does the delete, delete work? Yes. OK. Come on, that's also super impressive. 
¿no? So I, you know, I know it may sound like, what is this guy doing? So let's look inside that repo a little bit to talk, to see what that chart is. So here you have the typical structure of a Kubernetes uh, or Helm chart. Okay, you see that there is a file with metadata for that package chart.yaml, uh, keywords, description. Okay, that's boring. Metadata. Uh, you have a values.yaml. Those values get used inside the, the templates. And then in the template directory, what do you see? You see that you have, there is a config map object, there is a deployment object, uh, manifest for the front end, there is a service for the front end, there is an ingress that's to expose the front end. Uh, you have, uh, uh, okay, I'm going to explain that later. And then you have this one, backend functions. Those are serverless functions. And look at that. They're all expressed as really ugly Go template. I, personally, I don't like this, but you know, it works. Uh, so look, all those objects, they are kind function. And you see that everything is templatized. That's the way uh, Helm works. And you see you know, this is here the, the spec of a function. Uh, so that was the to-do create. Here you have another function. That's the uh, to-do update. So all the functions are actually defined as templates, and they are stored in the, um, in the chart package. So here I have, I, have, you know, I have the same thing. So you see here they are in my template. And if I go in the... In the template, I see, uh, you know, I see, uh, I see them. I see all the, all the functions here that are packaged inside the, the chart. What's interesting is that uh, you see that the Redis backend, the storage, is defined as a requirement. So that application, that to-do app, which is made of function, has a requirement, which is the Redis backend, and the Redis backend comes has a separate package. Okay. So I think that, uh, uh, is that all I wanted to, to show is that, yes. Okay. So, so the bottom line here, I wanted to show you those two examples because you have one which is continuous delivery where we actually have no package, but uh, we make use of the declarative aspect of Kubernetes, and we can deploy functions, and we can define triggers. And if you want to package everything, you can actually use Kubernetes uh, charts and, 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 and package it uh, you know, like this. Uh, and it works as a you know, single line install. Suddenly, you have, um, you have your to-do app. Oh, yes, that's, I knew I was uh, forgetting something. It's an example of service full because here we deployed Redis locally, okay? But if you pay attention uh, um, uh, to the templates, you'll see in the templates that we also have a Redis binding and a Redis instance. If you were running in a Kubernetes cluster that was using something that's called service catalog, you could actually uh, auto-provision a Redis cache on Azure and have your to-do application connect to that Redis cache in the cloud. To get that Redis cache you know, on, on, on Azure, you could do the same thing with AWS or, or Google. Uh, <laughs> and to define this provisioning, you write uh, an instance manifest and a binding manifest. And all of that can be put in that, uh, in that same chart. So you end up really with a cloud native application fully declared you know, as, a, as manifest. So serverless is coming, uh, definitely early innovators, early adopters. We'll see what it, uh, what it changes. Uh, there is going to be a question vers between you know, cloud versus on-premises. Does it, does, it does it mean anything? Uh, does it make sense to actually try to do this on-premises? Uh, and then you know, the CI CD, I think, is going to be very, very interesting. Uh, here I just showed you a basic example, but I have you know, some internal app where I'm actually truly cloud native. I'm, I'm on GKE, I have codes you know, on GitHub, and I have those pipelines set up 
and every time you know I make a I make a push, everything gets automatically uh, deployed. And now a blob is a blob is a blob. That was a conversation I had yesterday. Uh, you know whether it's a zip, a tar, a Docker image, you name it. You know, and the end, yes, you you're going to deploy some type of uh, some type of blob. But the, the, the big problem here is the immutability and, uh, and reproducibility. So thank you very much. Right on time, 00, zero at Sebgo on Twitter. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can I have a couple of questions? Uh, how do you debug if something going wrong? Yeah, so, so Container Builder has a uh, CLI that's called Container Builder Local. So the build you can you can debug it locally. The the lambdas uh, you have some code, especially for I mean not for Kubeless but for uh, AWS Lambda. There are some tools that allow you to actually uh, uh, run your Lambda uh, locally. I, I I forget how it's called, but uh, you have things like LAMCI, LAMCI, things like this that mimic the Lambda environment. Other questions? So, best practices tell us to build once and deploy the same artifact over and over again. So, if you have no version artifact, how does it fit that best practice? Yeah. So what? Yeah. So what I showed is definitely you know a, a CD for actually uh, for devs, but then from that you can definitely build. I mean, put in place your own pipeline with, uh, you know, environments for uh, dev, staging, prod. Uh, you know, do you do you merge via GitHub? Does the merge trigger the deployment in a specific environment? Do you do you actually uh, de uh, deploy on uh, Git push or uh, on any commit or just on tags? And then if you if you push on tags. Uh, then you can actually store artifacts and then tag those image, uh, those Docker images with those tags. So you can you can definitely put in place the the best practice that uh, that you have internally. Yeah, I don't think that's. I think it's totally doable. Any more questions? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh